Hello everyone, today we're going to wrap up the Gears lecture series. Uh, so today we're just going to talk mainly about gear types uh, and differential types too. I'm sure my dogs will freak out in the background a little bit so you might hear them. Uh, so we'll start with spur gears. So spur gears also called straight cut gears. Uh, they're straight cut because the face here is perpendicular to the surface uh, so they're essentially just an extruded profile. So for, for these, uh, they're the simplest to make. Uh, some, some advantages and disadvantages. So first advantage is they're, they're simpler to make, so they're usually going to be cheaper. Uh, they're usually a little more efficient, and I'll put up an efficiency table later on, but they're usually about the most efficient kind of involute gear as a straight cut gear. Uh, and why they're efficient is the contact occurs all across a line on the face. And... Um, so in that contact happens smoothly all along the, the tooth as it makes and breaks contact. So there's not really sliding on the face. That's when you have sliding on the face is when you have efficiency issues. So, uh, so they're usually efficient. Uh, they're simple. They're efficient. The downsides are contact is made all across the line and it's broken all across the line. And so when the contact is made, there's a, there's a sound from that. The contact, when the tooth slams into another tooth, uh, there's a sound. So spur gears have a very distinctive sound when they run, and as they run faster and, and have more torque, they make louder, higher frequency sound. Uh, and it can be pretty annoying. Uh, so if you're familiar with cars, uh, manual transmissions at all, uh, a lot of older manual transmissions, the reverse gear was a straight cut gear. And so in reverse, the car's transmission would sound different than when you were in a forward gear, and that, that's because uh, it had a straight cut reverse gear. Uh, the forward gear ratios are almost always helical gears, which we'll talk about in a second. So those are those are a lot more rare. Sorry, so those are a lot more common nowadays. Helical, uh, even helical reverses are are common nowadays. But if you have a manual transmission car and then the gears kind of whine when you're in reverse, that's why. Uh, on superchargers like root style blowers, things like that, that whine a lot of that noise is the gear noise. It's not the actual supercharger compressing air. That's pretty quiet. It's actually the, the straight cut gears and they could put helical gears in there and it'd be pretty quiet but that's not fun so they put straight cut gears in them so the superchargers whine really loud uh, so a little more efficient a little simpler a little cheaper uh, not stronger I'll talk about that in a second than the other kinds uh, but it, it's mainly the efficiency is why you'd want to use a spur cut gear from a performance perspective uh, from a cost perspective they're, they're, they're cheaper they're easier to make Helical gears, uh, so helical gears, the contact occurs all along the line here and it, it sort of makes it a point and then grows along it and then breaks along it too. Uh, so the contact's not all just bang contact, bang uncontact. So what that means is that they're, they run a lot smoother, uh, they're a lot quieter, and since the, the tooth is a lot longer because of the, the helix angle here, the tooth's a lot longer, uh, which means these are stronger. Too. So they're stronger, they're quieter, they're smoother, they're a little more difficult to make, but with a modern hobbing machine it's not that big of a deal. Uh, so helical is very common. They're just a little more expensive. They're a little less efficient because you get a little bit of sliding contact uh, on, on the face. So you, they're a little less efficient, but we're talking the difference between like 98 and 99% efficient. So it's not that big of a deal. Uh, they're in hands. So you can see here, these are not the same gear. So the same gear can't mesh with the same gear. Uh, you've got to have two gears that have opposite hands, so a left hand and a right hand gear have to mesh together. Uh, so that adds adds part numbers, adds cost too. Uh, but in automotive gears, they're almost always helical. Uh, they're, they're just stronger. Those big battleship gears I showed last time, they're helical because they're smoother and quieter and stronger. Uh, they're just a little bit less efficient. Again, it's a little bit less efficient. It's not, not that big of a deal. So... Uh, you see helicals a lot in, in automotive applications, power transmission applications, helical you see a lot. But you, you gotta, you got to remember this hand thing. That's something that's easy to forget about. So you got to make sure you, you order these in pairs. Uh, herringbone. Oh, so one disadvantage of helical. Uh, so uh, let me go back to the straight cut gear. So there's a normal force that occurs on the normal of contact between a tooth and the other tooth. In a straight cut gear, that's going to be perfectly radial. Uh, so there's not going to be any real axial force along the axis of, 
of the shaft this is going to be on. And so when it comes to sizing bearings and shafts and things like that, you don't have to worry about axial loading that much. So you might be able to get by with roller bearings, say. Uh, you know, ball bearings can do a little bit of, of uh, axial loading. Roller bearings really aren't designed for any axial loading. So you could use roller bearings, which are nice and strong, with straight cut gears. With helical gears, the normal is going to be somewhat pointed in the axial direction, which means you get axial force on the shafts. So you have to size the shafts for that axial force, which usually that's not the problem. Usually bearings are the problem. Uh, so you couldn't use a roller bearing unless you had some, some pair of these things with opposite hands to cancel forces out, which is what the herringbone here is. Uh, but you have to worry about it. So usually you'll see things like tapered roller bearings on helical shafts. So, that's Murray. He's barking at a car driving by. Uh, so you'll see axial load on, on these things. Uh, so that's just something when it comes to sizing, bearings, and picking bearing selection. That, that's a limitation on helical. But again, that, that's usually fairly minor compared to uh, you know, you, the, the smoothness and quietness, especially in an automotive application. You really need helical. Uh, straight cut gears are not acceptable for a passenger car. There's some race cars that have straight cut gearboxes, and they they whine very loudly. Uh, it's very noticeable. It's very loud, uh, and some people like that, but the average car buyer does not like that. Uh, herringbone. Again, these are just opposite pairs connected together, uh, and so that cancels out the axial load. You only really see these on big, big, big powertrain applications. Uh, you know, automotive stuff you just don't don't see it that much. So really big industrial applications, you might see herringbone. Uh, bevel, so when I need gears to uh, change change direction, uh, bevel gears have an intersecting axis here. Uh, I can have any angle between the shaft. So I can do 0 to 180 degrees uh, with this. Now, when you get to the 0 case, it's just two regular gears. And when you get to the 180 degrees case, it's the shaft. So uh, really anything between those, that's that's really what you're, what you're looking at for this. And more somewhere around 90 degrees plus or minus is more more common. Uh, these are an involute profile that's been tapered, extruded along a cone surface uh, so that the teeth get smaller as they get closer to the center uh, and they'll be truncated at some point in time like you can see these have been, been truncated. Uh, they work sort of like spur gears and that the contacts can be made and broken over a line so they'll be a little loud. Uh, they'll have all the same advantages and disadvantages of spur gears. But more complicated to make than, than those though because of the, the bevel. Uh, spiral bevel. So these are the helical equivalent uh, of bevel gears. Uh, here we've got all of the advantages and disadvantages of helical versus straight cut gears, uh, except we can change corners now too. and get a little more expensive to, uh, to make. Uh, the center of the axis of the ring and the pinion would be what these things would be called. Uh, those intersect. So the center of the pinion and the center of the ring intersect in this. That's a spiral bevel. When the center of the ring and the center of the pinion do not intersect, so in this case there's an offset down here for the pinion axis, you need a hypoid gear set. So this is a different tooth form. Uh, you can see the teeth on the pinion here are radically different than the teeth on a spiral spiral bevel here, right? A really, really kind of a crazy, crazy shape to these. So obviously more difficult to manufacture. Uh, there's very few places that actually manufacture these things. Uh, there's one huge common application to this. If you've done any wrenching on cars at all, you know uh, differential gears are almost always high point gears. So why? Uh, contact happens over a really long surface area on the smallest gear, which is the weakest one, and so they're strong. Uh, for the same reason, it's also very smooth. And also, you have this offset here, which means which the lowest part of a car is usually... Uh, the case beneath these the ring gears on the front or rear or front and rear if it's all-wheel drive. Uh, that's usually the lowest point on a car and by using high point you can actually bring the differential up relative to where the prop shaft, the drive shaft is and get a little bit extra ground clearance too. So it's really great in all ways. The only downside on these other than the cost and complexity is uh, the efficiency. <laughs> Murray, hush. The lower this gear gets the less efficient this gets. And it really, as this gets lower, it becomes more of a worm gear, and worm gear efficiency can be very bad. I'll have a table of that here in a second. But as long as you keep this in a reasonable range, 
you're talking 97 or 8 percent efficient so it's not not a big deal in like racing applications uh, when you're really putting a lot of torque on these things and a lot of speed these can get pretty hot you know burning two or three percent of four or five hundred horsepower is uh, it's a lot of power right I mean it's it's a lot of power so um, that's all got to go somewhere so it can actually overheat the oil and then once the oil gets hot it loses viscosity it stops lubricating as well and then you start getting more wear and these these things will fail so uh, these are very tricky to set up they have to be very precisely set up it's one of the jobs that a lot of small or home mechanics really don't want to mess with because uh, it needs to be done very precisely uh, and backlash is a huge important deal on these the backlash has to be just right uh, the bearings here are usually two tapered roller bearings. The preload on those has to be just right. Lots of little things that if you don't do, these these fail very, very early. I know that from personal experience. I've done four or five of these, and I've only done it wrong once. And I knew I was doing it wrong. I just needed to get it done. And I had the bearing preload wrong. And I ended up having to fix it the correct way about a year later. Uh, worm gears. So now we've got right angle drive. We also get very large ratios. Uh, and they can also wedge depending on the angle here of the worm which also is affect the ratio the the more to 90 degrees the this helix angle becomes to the shaft of the worm gear the more ratio uh, and the more likely it is to wedge so it literally cannot be back driven with a spur so uh, worms are pretty rare they're pretty difficult to make compared to other gear types uh, and their their efficiency is terrible so if you think about the interface between the worm and the spur down here, there's a lot of sliding contact, right? That that means friction. So the, the more this angle gets perpendicular to the angle of the shaft, the more sliding, the more friction, uh, and the efficiency loss is, is goes goes way through the roof on it. Uh, rack and pinion, so when you need to change rotation to translation, you use a rack, this is the rack, and then the pinion, the pinion's the little gear. Uh, this is an interesting one, it's a variable speed, which is pretty cool. So uh, as you turn the wheel more, it turns faster. Which so for a constant input, as you turn the steering wheel more, the, the rack would actually move more and the wheels would move more. And this is so when you're driving a car down the highway, like highway speed, you want real small, you want uh, large changes of steering to very small changes of of uh, output on the wheels. But when you're in like a parking lot, you want to really get the wheels to turn a lot when you start to turn the wheel more. So this is a variable speed geometry here, pretty pretty clever here. But a regular rack and pinion, it's going to be involute teeth on the pinion. The rack are actually trapezoidal, since this is not wrapped around a circle like an involute gear would be. Uh, the teeth on a rack are actually pure uh, trapezoids. They're not they're not involute, so there's a different different tooth profile uh, that you got to pay attention to if you're trying to make a model of this or make your own rack for, for whatever reason. Uh, Still all hobbed in most cases, though. So, uh, you know, this is the fancier one, but uh, even the simpler rack and pinions, are, they're still pretty complicated to make. Efficiency. Uh, parallel axis gears are high. and We're talking 98 to high 99% efficient. So your spur gears, your uh, internal spur gears, like in a planetary, helicals, uh, double helical, right, the herringbone. You know, these are the most efficient up here, and it, it drops down. to So the 99.5s are going to be more up here. The 98s are going to be down here. Uh, your straight bevel, spiral bevel, zero. I don't know what a zero is, but uh, 98 to 99%. You guys can Google that. Uh, Non-parallel, like hypoid, uh, 96 to 98 for reasonable values of the offset. Again, you can make it more like a terrible worm gear if you want to. Uh, you can see worm gears from good to terrible. Uh, you're going to get a huge amount of heat generation if you're trying to transmit power at 30% efficiency. So uh, it might be really attractive if you need like a 100 to 1 reduction to use a worm gear. Uh, but if you're transmitting a lot of power, you know, if you're doing a 1 horsepower servo uh, and you're trying and you're losing 70% of that to heat, then you know, you're only going to get, I about said 300 watts out of mixing units here. But you're only going to get you know a third of a horsepower out, and you're putting two thirds of a horsepower into generating heat, and that, that's going to cause problems, and it's going to wear really quick too. Uh, and high high poids are pretty good, but you know you're talking about a five to six to one ratio at at most with those is pretty pretty common. Uh, so it, usually for efficiency, we want to be up here. You know, for automotive applications, we take the efficiency hit because these things are so strong. 
and they run so smoothly. If you think about uh, like in an automotive application, the torque on a differential, the input gear, the pinion of the differential, it's really high. So just for an example, like my truck has got, uh, puts out about 800 pound feet of torque. And then it goes through about a three or four to one multiplication in the transmission. And so it might even be higher than that. And then plus the transfer case that, that almost doubles it. And you might have eight or 10,000 foot pounds of torque on the pinion. Uh, and it, and the forces are, are insane and so you need really really strong gears and even in something that makes a two or three hundred horsepower you're still talking about two or three hundred foot pounds of torque that gets multiplied up to a thousand foot pounds of torque and it's got to run reliably for over a hundred thousand miles so uh, you really need something that's very strong very smooth and, and uh, wears very nicely so high poids are still used despite you know incurring a one to two percent efficiency hit on the whole car uh, for other kinds of power transmission, uh, belts and chains, I'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, V-belts used to be real common in automotive applications. You still see these in industrial and agricultural engines. Fairly efficient, actually. Uh, they can slip, and that can be a bug or a feature. Uh, you can use that to uh, prevent this thing from dying. If one of these bearings locks up, these things will still run for a little while, will slip until they tear themselves apart. Uh, you can use it sort of as a, they use these a lot in like walk behind self-propelled lawnmowers. They use uh, the, the tension and the slip to control the speed and you just deal with the wear and the, the heat generated. That just, just, just deal with it in that application. Uh, so the, the slip can be a good thing, slip can be a bad thing on these. Uh, sometimes you don't want them to slip, sometimes you need them to let them slip. Uh, but it, it's an option with these. And again, efficiency is pretty high. Now if they're slipping, the efficiency is going to go in the crapper. Uh, but when they're working correctly, the efficiency is pretty high. Timing belts got these little teeth on it so they can't slip. Uh, if they slip, bad things happen. Uh, so these are very efficient, you know, 98% or so. So they're efficient, they don't slip. These can be made incredibly strong. There's been a lot of interesting research in timing belts in the last 10 or 15 years using composite, not composite gels, they're, they're inherently a composite because it's rubber or something like rubber on top of a really strong band uh, but with Kevlar or carbon fiber even bands in these things they can be incredibly incredibly strong uh, they're quiet they're very smooth uh, and they don't stretch with the glass fibers or with uh, carbon or Kevlar fibers in them they, they just don't stretch that much so uh, very high modulus of elasticity so they can be used for very accurate timing applications like timing camshafts and engines uh, or in CNC machines for, for moving moving axes around. Uh, they, they work really great for that. Uh, the tooth forms are very proprietary usually. Uh, there's some standard designs, but the really high-end belts seem to be proprietary, and you gotta buy the, the, the pulleys from the manufacturer that, of the belt. Uh, and it could get a little pricey, uh, but these are, these are pretty fun. I've done a couple setups on timing belts, one for a, a big electric dynamometer, 100 horsepower dynamometer. I shouldn't say big, that's not that big, but uh, it's a big motor. It's a big 100 horsepower electric motor, and you can send 100 horsepower through a belt that's only 30 millimeters wide, uh, and it runs almost silent, which is, which is nice. Uh, these things do wear out over time, uh, so they do have to be replaced, especially in automotive applications. If you have a car that uses one of these to time the camshafts, there'll be a service interval on the belt, and you need to pay attention to that. If you don't, uh, and this thing starts skipping teeth, the camshaft will get out of phase with the crankshaft and your valves might meet your pistons and that will be the end of your engine in most cases. Chains can be very efficient, high 98, 99 type percent. They don't slip. You know, if you have a slip with a chain, you got a problem. Uh, they require tensioning usually of some kind. Timing belts require tension. V-belts to some extent are self-tensioning if you set it up right. You still might have a tensioner on them, but you can do these without. You, they, they inherently tension themselves because of the little cone down here uh, they can you can uh, get these things to tension somewhat on their own if you have it set up right have the right size belt timing belt has to have tensioner chain uh, has to have some kind of tensioning mechanism whether it's just adjusting the center to center distance of the pulleys or having a, like a dog bone tensioner or something like that they, they need to be tensioned correctly or they'll skip uh, high efficiency these are going to be heavier than belts uh, they're going to be louder. Chains are pretty loud. Uh, 
So you don't see you see some chains and timing chains uh, in automotive applications, but they're a set called a silent chain. They're a lot different looking design, uh, and they run fairly quiet. These roller chains like this, they're they're really loud. And it's just because of when the roller makes contact with um, the sprocket here, that's going to clank, right? So you've got a lot of clanks per second when you when your shafts are spinning fast, and uh, they just they're loud. That's the biggest downside on chains. But they're really cheap. They're really strong. Uh, they're really pretty efficient. They require lubrication. Dry timing chains might not require lubrication in some applications. So uh, these are a lot easier to make. Sprockets are something that you can make on a regular mill or a CNC mill trivially. I've made lots of sprockets before. Uh, this is essentially, you know, for a, like a 520 chain, this is a half inch radius. You can get the thickness for this sprocket. And there's just a simple little chamfer up here and a chamfer here. And so you can actually make sprockets fine. Making timing belt pulleys does not work out very well most, most of the time. You need very, they're difficult to machine. They usually need to be wire EDM'd, and you need the, the proprietary tooth form for it. Uh, gear trains. So there's simple gear trains. Uh, this is an example of a simple gear train. We've got different size gears here, and we want to find the ratio from input to output. So I think I've actually gone on a little longer than I wanted to, on this lecture and uh, we've got time on Friday to finish this so what I think I'm going to do is go ahead and stop for today and we'll come back on Friday with this and finish gear trains uh, we're still way ahead of the schedule so I think that that sounds good to go ahead and stop now and then I'll, I'll take a little more time on gear trains and then I've got some differential stuff too so I'm really gonna got a lot of material here so it's probably worth splitting into two lectures so I think I'll stop it from here uh, and I'll put a homework together on gears next week. You guys are working on the CAMS homework. If you have any questions on homework, uh, just shoot me an email. Uh, I'll be available this week. And if you need to do a Zoom meeting or something like that, just, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to help with any questions on, on the CAMS homework. It's a pretty big homework. So just let me know if you need anything. So that's it for today. Thank you.